Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. This is Heidi from My Reading Life, and I'm here today to film my discussion videos of the two books that we picked for the Book Naturalist Book Club for the month of June. Now, in June, we were trying to pick books that met two different reading themes. The first is Pride, because June is Pride Month, and the second is Curvathon, which is a reading event that is sponsored by Karen over at Run Right Reads. Uh, and uh, Comfy Cozy Up is the other channel that hosts that readathon, and it is designed to get people to read books by Caribbean authors. So we were trying to hit those two themes, and I think we did a great job with the books that we picked. So the first book I'm going to talk about is How Far the Light Reaches, A Life in Ten Sea Creatures by Sabrina Imbler. Sabrina Imbler is a queer author that uses the pronouns they, them, and I'm going to try very hard not to misgender this author, so bear with me. Um, Sabrina Imbler is also a fairly young author. Uh, they are, this is their first uh, published book, I believe. They have written um, essays and articles that have been published in places like the New York Times, The Atlantic, and other online outlets. And this is the first collection of theirs. And I thought it was pretty well done. I think that it wasn't, there was issues that I had with it overall. I thought it was a really strong essay collection. I really enjoyed the topics that this author was exploring. Um, I think my problem with this was in the connections they were trying to make between the different creatures, the sea creatures, and their own personal life. So I actually preferred the parts where they were talking about the marine creatures um, more so than the exploration of personal issues. Um, and I find that with some of these collections that are a mixture of memoir and science writing that I often prefer the science stuff more than the personal essay stuff. And I do feel that some of the connections that they were trying to make were a little, were trying a little too hard to make those metaphors work. Um, and I think that this maybe isn't as a is a new author thing and as they write more and have more experience that that will smooth out and not become so obvious the um, connections that are trying to be made there the connections will be more subtle but I do think that the the different um, life forms that she's that they talked about that they selected to highlight in these essays were really fascinating um, and I really enjoyed learning more about those creatures, some of which I had read other things before, like there's stuff in here about immortal jellyfish, which reminded me of reading, um, oh, I read a book about jellyfish. <laughs> and coral reef, the woman writes about um, coral reefs too, and I, I'm totally blanking on her name. I'll try to remember to write it on the screen. But things like that that I've read, read about from other authors that I, I really enjoyed those topics. Um, the selection here that I've highlighted that I want to share with you is about goldfish, feral goldfish, um, to be precise, because this, a lot of times people get tired of having goldfish. And so they just release them into the wild, into a pond or a stream or something, and it can cause serious problems. <laughs> so I, I really enjoyed the way that this author wrote about the feral goldfish. So, uh, this is from page 19. I will always be a little bit in love with feral goldfish. I know this is the wrong lesson to take from it all. I know that they wreak an irreversible kind of havoc. They uproot bottom dwellers, trample ecosystems, sow tasseled parasites in the flesh of other fish. I know that once they take over a pond, they are impossible to extricate. I don't want a supremacy of goldfish, a world where fish the size of cantaloupes stampede through fragile ecosystems like wrecking balls. But when I think about ponds infested with gallon big goldfish, I feel a kind of triumph. I see something that no one expected to live, not just alive, but impossibly flourishing and no longer alone. I see a creature whose presence existence must have come as a surprise even to itself. So I thought, you know, there's some really excellent examples here of um, unexpected uh, species and species that are unexpectedly thriving and maybe in places where they weren't expected to be. And I like the connections that Imbler is making between herself as a, a queer person and a person of um, mixed heritage. Uh, her, I think she has Chinese background as well as some other things. And so like the connections that they're making between these uh, different disparate identities and some of these 
unexpected sea creatures is is really quite interesting so yeah I, a good collection uh but not um 100 successful for me um i think it was very good but not perfect and then secondly our book for a caribbean themed author we picked a novel this month and that is the mermaid of black conch by monique rothy and um Let's see if I can find my notes about the author. <laughs> Excuse me for a moment. Monique Rafi was born in Trinidad, and she is the author of six different novels and a memoir. Um, so she has got quite a few books under her belt. This is my first time reading this author. And this book uh, takes place off the coast, I believe, of a fictional island in the Caribbean called Black Conch. Um, and a fisherman, it's 1976, and a fisherman finds, um, encounters a mermaid while he's out fishing, and he forges a connection with this mermaid and um, ends up rescuing her when she is caught by some white uh, sport fishermen and brings her home <laughs> with him. And then, you know, what happens after you bring a mermaid home with you? Uh, and how is she, how did she become a mermaid? What is her backstory? Um, how is she going to fit into his life? Um, there are some excellent themes being explored here of uh, colonialism, of um, the impacts of tourism and sport fishing on island communities in the Caribbean, uh, on the impacts of them not only on the human inhabitants of these Caribbean islands, but also on the ecosystems around the Caribbean islands and what that means for the fish and the, uh, you know, all the different things that live in the ocean. Uh, there's some excellent descriptions of uh, stormy weather on the ocean that I just thought were, you know, just excellent. I loved this story. I really, really loved this story. I think it is, it's got a lot of elements in it that I really like in my fiction. There's a, a you know, there's ex exploration of themes that I'm interested in, interested in like um, human impact on the environment, um, uh, colonialism and the impacts of that long term uh, on places which are no longer ostensibly under the control of colonizers, but I have to live with that legacy. Um, it talks about the, the legacy of slavery and what that has, you know, how that impacts people in, in current time periods. I think all that is great. And then the legends of creatures like mermaids and how much of that comes from, you know, uh, the history of a place and then how much of it is, uh, you know, unexplained happenings that humans have tried to come up with some way <laughs> to explain things that they don't understand. I think this book melds all of those things really well. And the main characters of David, who is the fisherman and um, this mermaid, they're, they're fantastic. Plus the supporting characters that are around them that interact with our two main characters are really Really great, really well fleshed out, um, not just cardboard cutout uh, characters at all. Um, so I have a couple of little sections marked in this book as well to share with you uh, to just sort of give you a hint of what the writing style is like. I saw that part of this creature from my boat. Yards and yards of musty silver. It gave she a look of power, like she grow out of the tail itself. I think then that this fish woman must be heavy as a mule. I see she must weigh four or 500 pounds easy. When I see her first, I reckon she come from some half space in God's great order, like she was from a time when all creatures were getting designed. She was from when fish was leaving the sea behind, growing legs, turning into reptiles. She is. She was a creature that never make it to land, is what I was thinking before I hear she own story. I figure she and she kind get interrupted somewhere in the middle of God's act of creation. And that paragraph reminds me, I think that's an excellent description of the mermaid, um, but it also reminds me that there is just, there is, the dialect is not overwhelming in this book. Like I know, I, I am certainly a person that sometimes can find dialect overwhelming and I did not find the dialect in this story to be overwhelming at all. In fact, I found it to be atmospheric and to give me a sense of place in the story in a way that just enhanced the story for me. It did not detract. So do not be uh, fearful of that if dialect is something that can cause problems for you as well. And then, like I said, excellent descriptions of the ocean in this book as well. Um, so let me just read you this section about a description that I think you'll find enjoyable as well. 
So each of the men on board gazed outwards at the sea and felt alone and inside himself. The sea, that expanse of nothingness, could reflect a man back on himself. It had that effect. It was so endless and it moved around underneath the boat. It wasn't the same thing at all as being on any expanse of earth. The sea shifted. The sea could swallow the boat whole. The sea was the giant woman of the planet, fluid and contrary. All the, man shut, all the men shuddered as they gazed at her surface. Um, I saw, yeah, just awesome. I really was compelled by this book. I read it all in one 24 hour time period in two sittings. Um, I was just sucked into the story. It was really an enjoyable read for me. And you know, I am not a literary fiction person. I like literary fiction is not the thing that I would select like over other things. Um, and I am, I was so pleased with my response to this book and so happy that I had read it. So this I think is a fantastic example of Caribbean writing and why we should read more Caribbean literature. Um, and I'm so happy that we picked this for the Book Naturalist Book Club. So those were our selections for June for Pride Month and Cribathon. Um, very successful for those two. Now we have two books selected for July, um, and these are very summery types of books. So I think these both have to do with um, food and gardens and flowers and growing things and are perfect for uh, summertime reading. So the first book is by an author that's already been read in the book club. A couple of years ago, we had selected Amy Nazuka Matadal's book, uh, World of Wonders to read in the book club. And everybody really loved that book, including myself. It's one of my favorite reads that we've had in the club. Um, and so this is her newest collection. This is Bite by Bite, Nourishments and Jamborees. Um, and so, I mean, look at the illustrations in this book. And this is essays about different kinds of uh, plants and fruit and flowers and herbs and all that sort of thing. So, and I think this has, this is, um, it says it explores the way food and drink evoke our associations and remembrances, a subtext or layering, a flavor tinged with joy, shame, exuberance, grief, desire, or nostalgia. So very excited to try this essay collection because this is a one of my uh, favorite authors for sure. And then we have this memoir, um, Soil, The Story of a Black Mother's Garden by Camille T. Dungy. And this is a story of a woman who I believe is from Colorado. Yeah, Fort Collins, Colorado. And she uh, has a home in the area and she starts a garden in her yard. And what impact that has on herself and on her community um, and her experiences as a black person having a garden in a suburban uh, urban environment. So this cover, I mean, is like one of the most beautiful covers I've ever seen. Um, it has lovely uh, map of the yard uh, for the end pages. And I am so thrilled. I think it also has uh, illustrations on the inside. Yes. It does, um, and I am really looking forward to getting into this one. Yes. So I think both of these books are excellent picks for a summertime read, and uh, I hope that you will be able to join us in reading one or both of these books, um, Bite by Bite or Soil. I hope that you can join us. Let us know if you can. Please let me know also what you thought about our two picks for June, if you were able to read one or both of them, The Mermaid of Black Conch, or How Far the Light Reaches. I'd be very interested to know what you thought of them. I hope everyone's doing well and finding some great books to read. I'll talk to you later.